May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. Please be seated. I recently learned about a new meme. The DCist overheard column ran a joke about golden retriever boyfriends. I admit I wasn't familiar with this term, but you can find it online. A golden retriever boyfriend is what you might expect if your friendly, easygoing dog were transformed into a human. Laid back, truly loving, unbelievably loyal. So the joke, and it's not really even a joke, but maybe it's worth a smile, is captured in an overheard conversation about golden retriever boyfriends that starts like this. A youngish woman and a man are walking in Chinatown on Sunday. And the woman turns to the man and she says, you can't just pick up random gummy bears from the sidewalk. <laughs> Bada boom. I feel like the host of The Tonight Show. I feel like Jimmy Fallon. But that will, <laughs> that will end here because I wonder if instead of comparing our significant others to dog breeds, which seems objectifying to both the dogs and our loved ones, we instead compared God to dogs. Is God a golden retriever, loyal and full of love? Or is God more like a pit bull, reserved and protective? How can we understand God in terms that are familiar to us? In 1890, more than 130 years ago, a man named Francis Thompson wrote a poem later quoted by Tolkien and C.S. Lewis called The Hound of Heaven. This long, rather syrupy poem is about the pursuit of the narrator's soul by God. The narrator flees God and the chance to be saved, but God, like a hound of heaven, will not let him go. The hound is ferocious in his love. Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, the lines of the poem close, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou drives away love from thee, who drives away me. I think God is like that hound. God is the burr that sticks to us in the woods, the Velcro that keeps clinging. Our Savior wants to hold on to us in every moment of our lives. We run and run, chasing our personal goals and our hopes to find love and to succeed at work. We run and run until we stumble. Sometimes it's not till we fall down that we realize God is along with us, hitching a ride. We stumble because the economy has collapsed, perhaps. It has crashed and we lost a job. We stumble when the person we love lies to us, tearing the fabric of our reality. We stumble when our mother or our wife or our child descends into illness and we think there is no hope left in the world. It is then in our fall to the ground, that God, like a burr, sticks to us, like a hound of Helen, he, like a hound of heaven, God lifts us up. That is the lesson I hear in today's gospel reading. God is with us. God is with us in our suffering. This is God's desire to suffer with us, to take on our suffering as God's own. God suffers in the human suffering of Jesus. And in addition, and this is important, 
Jesus as Christ offers his very self in love to us. So that in our suffering, we are never, we are never alone. His deep acceptance of us is like a seed in our hearts, watered by our tears. All this past week and each day since October 7th, I followed in despair the war unfolding in the Middle East. Jewish babies decapitated, entire Palestinian families wiped out by a rocket blast, and now the saber rattling of countries near and abroad. What I want to share with you today is not about what is happening in the Middle East, but my heart is pulled to these bloodied and grieving humans. And I believe that God holds each of them in God's forgiving arms and asks them, as God asks us, to believe in God's peace and in the humanity of each child created in the image of the divine. I believe that God is with them in their suffering. Now, let's not fool ourselves. The reading from today from Matthew is also about torture and barbarous murder. The Son of God enters into death at the will of God the parent, who, strange as it seems, is manifesting his love for humanity by allowing Jesus to die for our sins. In that moment, in that moment of his death, in that moment right before his death, Jesus is separated from God's love. In this morning's reading, we heard Jesus cried out with a loud spirit, and Jesus cried out again with a loud spirit and relinquished, with a loud voice and relinquished his spirit. He cried again because in the line right before this readings, this reading, Jesus has cried out with a question that brings us up short and tears our hearts. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me, left me on my own? God is the omnipotent enemy of death, yet death is only overcome by the Son's willingness to enter into its darkness. In that moment of death, though the Son continues to exist, to be, he continues to be, the Son is separated from God the parent. God the Son submits to suffering and separation from God so that we never have to. We never have to. So Jesus is hanging from a beam and a cross piece. His feet and hands are nailed to the wood, and he has a hard time breathing as his lungs collapse. In these final hours, he is very human. We remember he is a carpenter who wandered through the villages and countryside of mostly Jewish Palestine. His mission was to heal and teach the people a faith of compassion, of devotion to God, to Abba, and humility. A teacher and prophet, he taught of God's direct, unqualified love of humans, first Jews and then later Gentiles. But we know, we know that Jesus is more than a man. He is the Christ, the Word, sent to us, sent to all humanity so that we can know God's character. Jesus is both fully human and fully divine, both son of woman and begotten of God. And right now on the cross, he suffers massive physical pain, his shoulders pulled from their sockets, his lungs filling, and yet, and yet, in his agony, his agony is not only for himself. His agony is for us. For each one of us who aches 
from loss of family, home, or sense of self, his agony for us is far greater. The world is changed forever by Jesus' death and momentary separation of his human self from God. The signs of this are in the passage we heard. So here's a way to look at the passage, to understand it maybe a little bit more clearly. If you read Shakespeare in high school or college, you were likely taught to look for symbols or for, look for foreshadowing. Romeo and Juliet, for example, are star-crossed lovers. A storm brews as conspirators plot Caesar's death in Julius Caesar. And such symbols appear in today's passage from Matthew. At Jesus' death, the entire world shakes in protest. Then look, the gospel cries, the curtain, the veil, that separates the inner sanctum of the temple from the people is torn in half, is torn in two. There is no more separation. This may signify that God is no longer contained within the temple. He is no longer contained in the tabernacle of the Jews, but comes to each of us, Jew and Gentile alike. God is no longer separated from us by the temple high priests, but enters each of our hearts. Like Elvis, God has left the building. Bodies of the saints rise up, foreshadowing the final resurrection. And in this moment, the doors of history have swung open on enormous hinges of light welcoming in a new age of love and compassion. But really, you might look at the past 2,000 years, and you might say, well, what's changed? Thousands die abroad in wars of territory and power. As the war in Ukraine grinds on, drones attack combatants and civilians alike. In our country, tens of thousands of Americans die each year by their own hand from despair and shame. In peaceful towns of central Maine, 18 people going about their business were shot at random by a deeply suffering man who then killed himself. And just this past Friday, a horrible story, of a mayor and pastor in Alabama who shot himself after being outed for cross-dressing. There's one difference. There's one difference. There are many differences. But there's one difference I'm going to bring us back to. I believe that Jesus is with us in our suffering. And I will tell you how I know this from personal experience. Sixteen years ago, I owned and loved a house with a wraparound porch in Chevy Chase. My two children were in or they were about to start college. I was a single mother with a job that paid for the house and for the school. And then in 2007, the Great Recession hit. And I lost almost everything. One job and then another evaporated. The house I built went into foreclosure. My dog died. I took up smoking and I looked for work. And then I signed up for 6 a.m. yoga classes. And one day, the day, the week Obama was sworn into office, I was in down dog on my yoga mat, and I began to cry, making little wet splashes on my mat. And then God appeared to me. I saw God in my mind descending like a shadow of golden sand, encircling an image 
of Jesus dying on the cross. And God said to Jesus and to me, everything will be all right. I am with you. I ran outside into the bitter cold rain. Six months later, I took a religious class at a seminary. A year later, I sold my house and moved away. For me, the day I began to cry, I allowed Jesus into my heart. The great door of history swung open to me, and the light came in. I was broken and had no place to go, and then Jesus seeped in like light through the cracks. In the hollowed out places in our souls, God takes up residence. I'm not healed and I will never return to how I was. But Jesus has stitched the wound and soothed the scar. And I hope that you who suffer will allow Jesus to come to you. Whether you are undone by childhood trauma or family pain, or simply bemoaning the loss of youth and identity. Take time for God's grace. I hope you will then find Jesus through meditation and prayer waiting for you, knocking at the entrance of your heart. Amen. <laughs>